Hi, very good morning. Uh, welcome to the Thermotic E Open House. I'm Miss Lee. I'm the HOD Science 2. And during this session, I will first give an overview of the Science Department and Talent Development Program, followed by my colleagues from the respective sciences. Okay, um, congratulations for completing the milestone exam that I'm sure you must be thinking very hard about your future. So what is your career aspiration? Right, in TJC, we support yours fully. So you have been reading news online recently. You have come across this recent article on Dr. Andy Tate, a former TJC. In fact, you will be hearing from his bio teacher, Mrs. Lam, later. He's currently an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at NUS, and his success stories begins with TJC. So if you're looking for ex, uh, achieving excellent academic results, fun and enriching learning experiences, join TJC Science Department. We have the same focus as you. These are the three subjects offered by the JT Science Department. Basically, biology, chemistry, as well as physics. We develop enriching and diverse learning experiences within and beyond classroom, as shown on the pictures. Our teachers are skillful, caring, and fun. So why wait? Join us. Next, let me share with you our signature talent development program. TJC has just launched our very own Thermatic STEM Academy last year. So what does the STEM Academy offer? We challenge students to stretch for themselves to the fullest academic potential. We encourage students to read a history science take up a research project and participate in key competitions so that our students can build a STEM-based portfolio, personal portfolio for university and scholarship application. Our STEM Academy program starts with a whole school approach to manage our talented students. We also engineer opportunities for students based on interests and aspirations, supported by strong mentorship from teachers and external partners. These are some of the external partnership with TJC. As you can see, we have something we have something catered for everyone. Next, let me share with you some of our recent achievements. Like one of the latest one is the results from the 32nd Singapore Chemistry Olympiad. TJC is one of the four JCs with a gold medalist. One of the students also awarded the best student which is given to participants participant obtaining the highest overall score. More success stories of our outstanding TJCs and our STEM champions. As you can see, our TJCs have a very well-developed STEM-based portfolio. So, why wait? Let your success stories begin with TJC. Next, I'll pass the time to Mrs. Lam, our acting senior teacher from the biology department. Mrs. Lam, please. Hey, hello everyone. I'm going to share with you now. Let me share the screen with you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Ms. Lin. Uh, welcome to the virtual session. And I'm now going to share with you um, about uh, H2 Biology, okay, at TJC, and I would like to, uh, of course, uh, bring you on a small little journey today, this morning, okay? You have gone through primary school, secondary school science, and now you are ready to go on to um, JC uh, study science, and I would like to welcome you to the world of biology at Tamasic Junior College. I'm going to share with you how we teach it, uh, how we engage our students, and how we allow you and um, help you to even master um, the biology concepts. Okay, so if you take H2 bio, right, uh, there are five units that you'll be covering cells, bi biological molecules, genetics, inheritance. Uh, these are topics that you will have covered under O-level bio, and the energy equilibrium will be photosynthesis respiration. You also have covered a bit of it um, in your pure bio and maybe your combined science. So it's really um, a continuation of your O-level bio. Then, of course, when you take 
A-level bio. Uh, you will study this exciting topic, infectious disease, and uh, you find it very relevant, very current. Okay, and then there's also the biological evolution part. So how do we allow you to explore and enjoy what you study? All right, so I'm going to share with you our pedagogical approaches, right? by which we make use of blended learning and we um, engage students through lectures and we have live lecture in the lecture theatre. We also have lecture recording that we upload so that students can review and be able to revisit the concepts. Then of course we have tutorial uh, where we uh, conduct it in a classroom and in a smaller group setting. We also make use of Google Classroom. Uh, in our classroom tutorials uh, many times we have modeling to make uh, thinking visible, collaborative learning as well. And then there's the practical component uh, whereby we uh, do upload the uh, pre-practical video so that students are more prepared for practical and will be able to learn and enjoy the practical session and develop the uh, skills. And um, there is also the virtual aspect by which we um, essentially make use of student learning space, Google Meet, Google Classroom, Zoom and your pod. Okay, so some of you are familiar with this with COVID, of course, um, there's the blended learning of virtual as well as on-site learning. Okay, and then um, for I just want to show you since you're not able to tour our college uh, how a lecture theatre will look like and so this is a smaller lecture theatre, bio usually is in larger lecture theatre but um, there'll be a teacher that will be teaching and then um, uh, you will get to learn the concepts using following with the lecture notes, right? And then this is a tutorial setting. Uh, of course, this is pre-COVID days, you know, whereby students are able to sit right next to each other. Now with COVID, then essentially there is like a gap in between. But um, we not only have pen and paper exercises and learning using pen and paper, uh, method we also like I mentioned just now modeling uh, to make thinking visible and we always strive at TJ Bio uh, to uh, make the abstract become concrete and uh, students really enjoy the collaborative work and um, the model building and then uh, this shows you how a practical looks like uh, you can see a student here doing a potato experiment, which you have probably done so in Pure Bio. And uh, there's also, apart from this uh, experiments that you mix chemicals, uh, we also dedicate a large proportion to uh, developing the microscopy skills. And I want to assure you that if you come to TJ, right, we have a very good team of teachers and you'll be able to master the microscopy skills very quickly. And then it will open you to a brand new world a whole new world of microscopic uh, specimens. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you through right, like a sample lecture, what it would be like if you were to sit through a lecture, okay, uh, the learning that takes place and the method and how we go about teaching. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, this topic, which is an extension topic, infectious disease, uh, to conduct my sample lecture. And I, I know that you will find something you can identify with. And this is like one of those uh, topics that would be taught in, it is a topic taught in GC2, and it kind of combines a lot of the different uh, other topics that you have learned in GC1. So infectious disease, right, you'll learn about your immune system, which is very exciting. You actually learn how you are protected from uh, all the pathogens from viral and bacterial infection, right, including TB. So you'll be learning um, these aspects. And then, of course, uh, in infectious disease, you'll be learning about vaccination, what it is, how do we develop it, right, how does it protect us, and then also modes of action antibiotic, right? So this is uh, what you can look forward to. And, um, right, in, um, in TJ Bio, we always like to start from what you're familiar with uh, when we teach a new topic. So I'm going to start with something I'm familiar with, right? You may have watched this movie, Contagion, right? Uh, if not, then you definitely would have watched World War Z, right? Our popular Brad Pitt, and then um, maybe Scott Strauss, right? Some of these movies, you may have watched it, some you may not, right? Train to Busan. Uh, if, you are, if you enjoy Netflix, you probably can revisit some of this old movie, right? So what is the common thing about all this movie? So when we lecture, right, we also don't just talk only, we engage the students. So anybody can feel free to uh, answer the question. What's the common feature about this movie? Anybody? Yeah, I think you are too shy. Okay, so the common, right, common feature about this movie is all about viruses, 
and if you take the A-level biosyllabus, you'll learn about viruses, uh, what they are, okay? And uh, you will actually get to be addressing some of this, you know, uh, movies, can it really happen? Can you be bitten by like, uh, can we be infected by a virus and become a zombie, <laughs> you know? Or a zombie bites you, right? In about, you know, a few minutes time, you turn to a, 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 a brand new zombie. So it, it'll be interesting, you know, when you take uh, bio at uh, JC. And of course, we also have our own drama, you know, worldwide drama. Uh, in last, it started last year, you have seen pictures like this or, you know, people fighting in grocery stores, supermarkets, right? And you see all these pictures all over the world, right? Shelves are empty, okay? And of course, this uh, interesting phenomena of uh, people hoarding toilet paper. I'm not sure if you are one of those who went with your parents to hoard on toilet paper, right? So apparently, right, all this is due to the disease that we encountered and it started spreading throughout the world at the beginning of last year, right? Um, so anybody would like to answer the question, what is the name of the disease? Again, silence. It's okay, All right? You're probably very shy. Um, the name of the disease, everybody should know it's COVID-19, right? Uh, name of the virus is a very long name, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, okay? SARS-CoV-2. And you actually will learn about all this if you learn uh, H2 bio. Of course, we don't go deep into coronavirus, but you know, virus, how do virus actually uh, infect the whole cell, right? The question that you will get to answer, right, which is on everybody's mind is why is everybody so fearful of this virus? And of course, by now we know because, right, as of yesterday, I got these figures from, you know, the website was, uh, yesterday is that it has really infected 90 million people worldwide. Okay, it's very infectious and it's caused almost 2 million deaths worldwide. So it is something that we are concerned about and you read it daily in the newspaper and um, the question is, right, why do novel viruses cause many deaths? And if you were to take bio right, at JC, you will actually get to learn about this. Right? When you have a new virus, why would it cause many deaths? And then there's the question, can we have a cure from the virus? Right? And of course, it would be wonderful if there's a cure, but we know that there isn't. But what is current right now is that you keep hearing the word vaccine, right? You uh, read about it in the papers. And so you learn about this in H2Bio. And um, this was an article that I actually sent to my students. So when we teach uh, biology at A-level, we don't just cover the A-level syllabus, but we want to make uh, what you learn uh, be able to relate to real life situations. So while the vaccine was being developed, right, we were sharing this with our students and you get to actually understand what are the different types of vaccine, you know? And the question is, um, why, why does, you know, vaccine, why does everybody think that vaccine is the solution? You get to learn about that, okay? And can vaccine really help us to be immune with, uh, to COVID-19? So it does provide immunity, right? If not, then you wouldn't have read this news, right? This was the breaking news, uh, sorry. This was the breaking news on uh, January 8th. Our Prime Minister received his first dose, okay, of this particular vaccine, which is M RNA vaccine. So if you take the bio again, you understand when you talk about, oh, this is a new form of manner in which vaccine is developed. So you will actually understand what's going on around you, okay? So um, apart from coronavirus, right, we actually are bombarded by pathogens and toxins all the time. And really, we are engaged in cell wars. Our immune system is fighting the battle, the warfare all the time, right? So uh, when you study infectious disease, you actually study what are pathogens, okay? So I'll do a quick run through. Uh, do <laughs> I do have an important reminder that there'll be graphic images, viewers' discretion advice. <laughs> okay, so you you learn what are the different pathogens like parasites. Actually, this this picture right, the, I took it from a Straits Times. It was a, wool, a tapeworm that they extracted from a, a man in Singapore. It was like eight meters long, you know. And then uh, malaria is caused by protozoa, fungus, you know, that we encounter, athletes, food, and ringworm are all actually pathogen caused by fungus. And then leprosy caused by 
uh, bacteria and then viruses, you know, and this one is, I know it's very gross, but this is the Ebola virus that actually can't eat away at the flesh. Okay, and then of course there's prion, which is the most intriguing thing that cause uh, what we call Metcalfe's disease. So these are pathogens, right? Our immune system have to deal with it all the time. Okay, and they're called pathogens because they cause diseases and they infect, infect the whole cell. So our immune system is actually uh, divided into two, two categories. There's the innate and then there is the uh, adaptive. Right? So you'll be learning you know, into in-depth knowledge about your immune system and uh, there are both the cellular component as well as the humoral, which are all the macromolecules. Right. So essentially, you have actually learned a little bit of this in uh, pure bio because you have learned about blood cells. You also have learned about antibodies in your pure bio syllabus. And you will actually add on to those knowledge that you have and see how those are very important to our body. Right. And so um, in our immune system, there are three lines of defense. Okay, We start with the first line, the second line, the third line. And um, each line of defense has its own purpose. Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit into the first line of defense, which is part of the innate. And ba basically, it is to prevent entry. So um, it is really the skin, the mucous membrane, and so on. It's when the first line of um, defense is broken and the security breach, right? Then it will be code read, the signal will be given, right? Then you get to actually learn, right? What happened if there is a breach? You know, and then how the macromolecules in your body will come in to protect you, as well as blood cells, which are like the garbage disposer, you know, the cellular component that will remove viruses and bacteria that have entered. Okay, I'm going to let you watch a video to show you. Um, so when we lecture, right, we don't just talk, you know, we try to make use of videos to allow students to better understand and um, have a better idea of the concepts that we're teaching. Sometimes the video is created by us or it could be a video like we, um, that's commercially produced. Uh, sorry, I think there is some sound problem with the sharing. Give me a minute. Okay, yeah. Immune system's first sorry defense is our skin, the largest organ of our body. The skin covers a total area of about two square meters, the size of a typical basketball backboard. When microbes attack, they're routinely deflected by the skin. Inside our bodies, mucous membranes are slimy, warm surfaces that make up about 400 square meters, roughly the size of an entire basketball court. They're under constant attack from microbes in the air we breathe and the food we eat. They line our nose, throat, intestines, and reproductive tracts. That's a large area to defend. Your mucous membranes are going to need help. Fortunately, certain cells in your body have evolved to fend off microscopic attackers. Early responders, like this macrophage, identify invaders and attack. They also give off chemical signals, called cytokines, to call up reinforcements like neutrophils and natural killer cells. Macrophages, neutrophils, and natural killer cells, collectively referred to as innate immunity, are nonspecific, often sacrificing healthy tissue to contain an infection. But if the invader slips through, you're going to need a more targeted defense. Okay, so I hope you have um, enjoy the video. So usually uh, we will upload the video also on our learning platform so students could revisit, right? So what you have um, 
seen in the video is that there are immune cells that are constantly on patrol and they really are protecting your body all the time, right? Uh, this is, um, so this is another video that you see. How your immune cells are protecting you. So you can see in the video, the bacteria is being engulfed by the neutrophil and the macrophage. Essentially at uh, TJ, right, what when we teach, we always try our best to come up with ways to allow students to understand the concept, right? So if you are interested to learn more about the ongoing war, cell war, come uh, join TJ, join the TJ Bio uh, uh, and, and take TJ, uh, take biology at TJC, right? Not just to stop coronavirus, but also to learn all about pathogen, right? These are articles that we send to students so that they can read and see what's the relevance of what they are learning. I'm sure you have read this article about this hawker. Okay, you learn about vaccination, I've mentioned before, and then antib antibiotics as well. All right, I hope you have enjoyed the sample session. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Mr. Tia Li Cheng. So I am from the chemistry department at Temasek Junior College. So uh, welcome to uh, all of you here. So uh, before I begin, I'm just going to go through a quick run through of what you will learn in chemistry at the A levels. Um, right. So, right. So this is what you will learn. You will notice that essentially it is basically a built on of uh, the chemistry that you have learned at all levels, right? So these topics, you should have seen it before. You have things like um, under matter, you have things like more concept, that's stoichiometry, uh, redox reactions, uh, energetics, uh, where is the endothermic, exothermic reactions, chemical kinetics, how fast or slow reactions are, equilibria, whether a reaction is reversible or not, and then you have the other topics on the structure and properties of matters. Chemistry is always very concerned, okay, with the micro aspect. So we take a look at things like atomic structure, chemical bonding, uh, periodic table, um, gas laws, things like that, all right? And then there are the additional extension topics that you will learn. So things like acids, bases, and salts that will be under chemistry of aqueous solutions, organic chemistry, electrochemistry, and of course, transition metals, etc., etc. So all of these topics you should have come across before at the O levels, okay? But now at the A levels, if you are taking chemistry, and I believe most of you are, if you are a science student, you will learn it more in depth, okay? And the breadth will be, of course, slightly wider, all right? Um, so that's uh, it about the introduction to chemistry. So I'm going to show you uh, how we teach chemistry at TJ. We have a very uh, ex uh, enthusiastic group of teachers. So we use different techniques, okay, to teach chemistry, the videos, um, experiments, demonstrations, uh, and different other activities. So one of my colleagues, a senior teacher, she actually has uh, prepared a uh, teaching video, okay, which she created uh, on chemical kinetics. Now, chemical kinetics is uh, a very important topic uh, in chemistry and in, in fact, in real life, okay? The food you eat, okay, if you want to preserve food, essentially you are trying to slow down the rate of decomposition or oxidation of the food, okay? And that actually involves chemical kinetics, okay? Of course, in certain other reactions, you want to speed up the reactions, right? But uh, let's just look at her uh, short um, uh, lesson 
on how the uh, factors affecting uh, on the factors affecting chemical kinetics. So uh, just give me a minute and I'll share what she has done. Hello everyone, I'm Mrs. Eileen Lim and I'm going to conduct a sample lecture for chemistry. I hope you will enjoy it. Today's lecture, I'm going to showcase the wonders of chemistry. Chemistry is colorful, magical and exciting. All of you I'm sure are familiar with this topic, chemical kinetics, which is the study of the rate of reaction. Do you remember what are the factors that affect the rate of a reaction? I hope you do. I'll give you some time to recall. Now, there are five factors that affect rate of reaction, namely concentration of reactants, temperature, catalyst, pressure for gaseous reactants, physical state of reactants. Today, I'm going to discuss how concentration of reactants, temperature, and catalyst affect the rate of reaction. First, let's look at the effect of concentration of reactants on the rate of reaction. We can use the iodine clock experiment to illustrate this. In this experiment, hydrogen peroxide oxidizes iodide to iodine in the presence of acid as shown in the equation. The iodine produced can be detected by using starch to give a blue-black solution. Now watch a video of the effect of concentration of hydrogen peroxide on the rate of reaction. Let's start with a 0.1 mole per dm cube of hydrogen peroxide solution. We are going to take note of the time taken for the blue-black coloration to appear. Now we add the acidified iodide solution, give it a good mix. We shall wait for the blue-black color to appear. Note that it took about 12 seconds for the blue-black color to appear. Next, we are going to repeat the experiment using a lower concentration of hydrogen peroxide solution. We are going to use 0.05 mole per dm cube hydrogen peroxide solution, half the concentration of what we used just now. Add the acidified iodide solution. Give it a good mix and wait for the blue black color to appear. Notice it's taking longer now. It took about 25 seconds for the blue-black coloration to appear. The time approximately doubled. That is, the rate of reaction is slower when concentration of hydrogen peroxide decreases. Now let's look, let's look at the effect of temperature on the rate of a reaction. In this experiment, purple manganate oxidizes ethane dioate to carbon dioxide and itself reduces to manganese 2. Manganese 2 is faintly pink but appears practically colorless. When the reaction takes place, the purple manganate will decolorize. First, we prepare a hot solution of the sodium ethane dioate solution. The experiment is conducted using cold and hot sodium ethane dioate. Now we're going to add two drops of purple manganate to both boiling tubes. Give it a good shake. Notice that the hot sodium ethane dioate causes the manganate to decolorize instantly, whereas the cold sodium ethane dioate did not decolorize immediately. This shows that rate of reaction increases with temperature. Now for the effect of catalyst on the rate of 
reaction. For this, we are going to look at the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide decomposes to oxygen and water. When decomposition occurs, effervescence of oxygen should be observed. The catalyst for the decomposition is potassium iodide. We will conduct the experiment using a fish tank. The standard flask contains hydrogen peroxide. Notice the peroxide is decomposing very slowly, hence you do not see effervescence of oxygen. I'm now going to add some detergent to make the decomposition more visible. Be patient because the detergent is very viscous and it will take some time for it to go down the standard flask. Right, mix well. Now I'm going to add some dye for better effect. The green dye is now added, followed by the red dye. Mix well again. Now I'm going to add the potassium iodide catalyst. Observe what happens. Notice the bubbles going up the standard flask. There's vigorous effervescence now and the bubbles are going to be pushed out of the flask. So the decomposition is now occurring very fast. That's how a catalyst affects the rate of a reaction. The catalyst speeds up the rate of a reaction tremendously. I'm going to give you a chemistry challenge now. I'm going to show you a series of color changes. We have a green tea colored solution in the leftmost flask. We also have two other conical flasks and a measuring cylinder containing a colorless solution. Adding the green tea solution to the second conical flask gives a black colored solution. Adding the black current colored solution to the third conical flask. gives a coffee colored solution. Adding the colorless solution to this conical flask, the coffee colored solution turns to milk. Can you explain these observations? I'm going to give you a hint. These reactions involve redox reactions. If you want the answer, join us at TJ. Thank you. All right. Um, so that is essentially our uh, short uh, lesson by uh, our senior teacher, Mrs. Lim. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mr. Wong and I teach uh, physics in TJC. So today I'm going to give you an overview of what we teach in TJC and uh, the ways that we uh, use to uh, uh, bring the idea across. Okay, so um, if you have a background in O-level pure applied physics, one of the most popular options that you can choose in JC is the H2 physics course, right? So the H2 physics course, as you can see here, has got uh, five big areas, okay? And a lot of topics under each areas are 
uh, should be quite familiar to you. Uh, topics like dynamics, um, temperature, um, even waves, current electricity, all these are taught in O levels. But the difference between O level and A level is that we go into much more depth in each topic that you have learned before. We also cover new topics, uh, exciting stuff like uh, superposition, right? and even quantum physics, under modern physics. So there's an increase in scope as well as an increase in uh, complexity. All right. Uh, if you think H2 physics, it's uh, not for you. There's another option, which is uh, not manageable. It's the H1 option, which instead of five uh, big themes, it is reduced to three themes. So in terms of scope, it is reduced, right? But in terms of uh, depth, it is pretty similar. All right, so we offer both of these, as well as the more challenging H3 physics, both university-based and school-based for students who are really enthusiastic about uh, taking physics. Um, on top of that, we also have in-house Olympiad training programs uh, for you to learn uh, physics content far beyond the A-level syllabus. All right, so how do we uh, teach physics concepts? We have lectures, uh, tutorials, as well as practicals. But it is our team of uh, really dedicated and strong physics teachers that make a difference, right? It's how we teach them the, the concepts uh, that, are, that, that is um, really uh, good. Okay, so the, uh, one of the things that feature in our teaching, it's always to link uh, physics concepts to real life uh, examples, all right? So I have a card here, right? That you can see that's uh, free to move on the table. Now, if I were to switch on the switch, it will cause the fan to turn. All right, so maybe take a few moments to think about how would this card move on the table if I were to switch on the fan? Does it move to your right, to your left, or does it remain stationary? All right, I hope you have an answer. So let us take a look at what happens. See, so after switching the fan, the uh, card moves to your right. Okay, so you should be able to uh, explain this using what you've learned in O levels, isn't it? Um, it's because at the moment when the fan pushes the air out, the air will exert an equal and opposite force due to Newton's third law on the fan. Okay, so the fan pushes the air to your left, the air pushes the fan to the right. And that's how the uh, card moves towards your right. Okay, so, so far so good. Hope it's a good recap. But let us look at something that's more complex, okay? If I were to put a plastic sheet here, so it acts like a, like a sail, right? When the wind blows towards the plastic sheet. And I'll do the same thing, I'll switch on the fan. What do you think will happen to the card? Again, three possibilities. It will move to the right, your left, or it will remain at rest. Okay, take a moment to consider this uh, physical setup. All right, so let's take a look at what happens. Can you see that the card remains still? It doesn't move as before. Okay, it might be very tempting to think that um, because the wind is blowing on the plastic sheet, it will cause the card to move to your left. Okay, that's uh, quite a tempting response, right? But, but the truth is that um, you have to consider the force on the fan as well, okay? Remember our first demonstration, you already said that there is a force acting on the fan towards the right. So these two forces, the one on the fan and the one on the uh, plastic sheet due to the, the, the air pushing on it, are pretty similar, okay? That's why it remains in I hope this gives you some food for thought uh, over lunch later. But in A-levels, you will learn another concept it's the conservation of momentum, which allows us to explain um, this physical phenomenon from a different perspective. And it will be taught in a few months' time. Okay. Um, there's another interesting phenomenon, all right, that I think for even for O level students, uh, it, it's actually pretty interesting. I have a track here. <clears throat> this is, uh, we call this a loop the loop, all right. So, what happens is that if I were to release a marble along the track somewhere here, it will go along this track. And I'll just let you see what happens, okay? So 
See, sometimes it doesn't complete the loop, but if I have to release it from a higher point, okay? Higher point. Oops. Maybe not high enough. See? It loops the loop and it ends up here. Okay, so the question is, what is actually the condition, which means how high must I release the marble such that it can complete the loop? Okay, so this is very interesting. It has um, got real life examples related to roller coaster rides, right? You know that the roller coaster must move really fast in order to complete the loop safely. Um, so um, this is under the concept of motion in a circle, but actually you have some background knowledge that you can actually start thinking about this question. Let me guide you along, right? So a good starting point would be to use conservation of energy, which everyone has learned, right? So by conservation energy, if I were to release it at a certain height, let's say here, it has potential energy, which gets converted to kinetic energy at the bottom of, uh, of the track. So it gains speed, it speeds up, and then as it goes up, the track, it slows down until you will reach the highest point. So using the conservation energy, the bare minimum height that you must release, it's somewhere here, right? It's the same height as the top of the track. But think carefully, is it enough to allow the marble to complete the loop? Now, even if there's no friction, of course, well, there's some friction here, so you may need to, to, to release it higher. But even if there's no friction, if you think carefully, it is not enough isn't it? Because if the, ball, if, if the marble goes down and it comes up, it will lose all its Ke, right? And so it will stop. And when it stops, there's no way for it to continue further along the track. It will just fall, okay? So there are very interesting ways to approach this question, which we will discuss in our uh, physics lecture. So I look forward to uh, share more with you if you join us uh, in a few months' time. It's under the topic of circular motion, okay? Last but not, uh, but not least, we'll just uh, end with a simple one, the really simple one, a quick my two sheets of plastic here, very, really quickly. You can see through the plastic, right? You can see my nose and my mouth pretty clearly. If I had to put another sheet of plastic, okay, less light through it, but you can still see me, right? Now, what happens if I would just rotate it by 90 degrees? See? You can barely, you, can, you can't see my nose now, you can't see my mouth. Okay, so what is actually happening? Why has the, uh, the light that passes through the plastic got to do with the angle between these two plastic sheets? It looks like a very similar, uh, sorry, a very simple uh, phenomenon, but the explanation is surprisingly uh, difficult. Okay, and this is something that uh, it's not covered in the O levels. Um, but we will guide you along with you come join us. It's under the uh, topic of superposition, okay? In order to understand this, you need to understand how waves superpose and the microscopic um, structure of these uh, plastics. They are not uh, normal plastics sheets that uh, you are more used to. They are called polarizers, okay? So we, we are a team of teachers, really dedicated, really uh, enthusiastic about linking physics to real life. And um, yeah, 